going on, everyone? Welcome to the Focus TV season seven, episode 16. We got Raymond Lyons here and Wilson Tarpe Jr. The two of us will be holding down the fort this week. Um, uh, got a lot going on in sports this week. We got the NBA combine, we got some interesting topics there, rap, rapid fire, uh, very quickly. A uh, couple, one of the topics I'm sure all of you guys are very aware of. We're going to talk about it anyways. Uh, DC United had their season, uh, season home opener. Well, they had their home opener and their season opener all wrapped up in the same game. So the new regime, uh, we're going to talk about that just a little bit. And then we're going to get into some college basketball. But we're going to start with the Washington Wizards, who are currently, as we're taping this, in the middle of the game with the Golden State Warriors. I think they're trailing at halftime by just a few points. Uh, for those of you that watch Wizards Outlook, we'll see some of you all later after we're done taping to break down the results of this game. That said, Ray, what happened prior to this game with the Washington Wizards? Uh, same thing that's been happening every night, Pinky. <laughs> the Wizards been losing. Um, they're uh, they're riding a 11 game losing streak and they um a 14 game home losing streak. So um, yeah, I mean we we all know what it is. Uh, just <laughs> not a lot good going on in, in Wizards world. Um, they came off an All Star break. Uh, faced the Nuggets last Thursday. Dropped that one, 130 to 110. Then on a the back-to-back, uh, played Oklahoma City and got demolished, 147 to 106. Uh, then on Sunday, dropped one to Cleveland, 114 to 105. So, um, yeah, it it's just not a lot good to talk about here. Um, you know, heading into the break, um, you know, they were looking at least semi-competent. Um, you know, still not not a lot of winning going on, but you know they 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 were looking like they were actually trying to compete. Um, you know that that could have been a combination of a lot of things. Teams just kind of, you know, dogging it, waiting until you know to all star break, or you know just just a little fatigue in the middle of the season. Um, but yeah, after the break, teams are locked in, and they happen to play. <laughs> Two of the best teams in the West and one and one of the hottest teams in the league. Um, fresh off all star break and drop those three games. So, you know, guys are locked in now and and the Wizards are not, you know, plain and simple. Um, you know, a positive out of the Cleveland game. Um, Jordan Poole probably had one of his best two games of the season. Um, you know, is he he just was aggressive, decisive, and and, and he played well. He was efficient. You know, he led the uh, led the team with 31 points. Uh, just couldn't translate to a win. Um, you know, same things that been plaguing this team the entire season. Uh, they couldn't get stops, and um, and then at crucial points in the game, the decision making just wasn't there. Uh, you know, so that those are just some things they got to fix, man. Again, as we continue to say, we're <laughs> we're at the bottom level here, man. It, it's it's only building up from here, but um, yeah, it's gonna be ugly for a minute. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's just, it's just tough to watch. Um, but you know, tonight they're down at halftime, sixty to fifty-eight. Um, you know how we feel about giving up sixty points and a half, um, and they almost gave us one of those forty-point quarters for the opposing team. Uh, Golden State scored thirty-seven in the second quarter, um, but. The thing that's frightening about this, Steph Curry's 0 for 7. Hasn't scored yet. So eventually <laughs> it's gonna the law of averages is gonna take over and the ball's gonna go in the basket for him. <laughs> and given how this team plays defense, those floodgates can open up pretty quick. So um, so yeah, man, you know, hopefully they can just stay locked in this, on some level in the second half. And keep this thing respectable, um, yeah, because it, it just has potential to uh, to get out of hand. Uh, but yeah, like Wilson said, we'll check in with you guys later for his outlook. So um, you know, we can go over the final result for that game. Yeah, uh, you mentioned the part that 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 worried me just a tad is uh, that nuclear one nuclear Steph Curry uh, is over seven, a couple air balls, like you know, can only take a quarter. Another thing, you know, that mixed with the Wizards' trend of when they're close in the first half, something's typically going to break one way or another. Um, it be interesting to see how, how it plays out. 
uh, is the safest way to say it. Very interesting to see how that plays out. Uh, we're going to move into college ball, basketball. Uh, with Cardo and I here, Ray is going to take over GW this week, and I'll follow up with Maryland. Um, the revolutionaries have been going through it like the last two months. So um, similar to the Wizards, I'd be shocked if – good news? Yeah, uh, they dropped a weird one to St. Louis, um, 96 to 91. Uh, yeah, man, this is this is one of the strangest endings to a game I've ever seen. Um, the Billikens didn't make a field goal for the final seven minutes and 42 seconds of the game. Their final 17 points came from the free throw line. Um, so, yeah, that, that just tells you a little bit how this game went and how GW season has been going of late. But um, – you know, out of out of out of that bad news, a little bit of good news. Um, James Bishop the fourth, uh, he set a new season high with 34 points, um, scoring his 2,000 point in his career uh, at the end of the first half. But um, like I said, yeah, the G, uh, the Revolutionaries just couldn't get the win. Um, Bishop became just the third player in program history to reach the 2,000 point mark on the three pointers. Time expired at the end of the first half, uh, giving him 18 points before intermission. Uh, he joins. The program's all-time leading scorer, Chris Monroe, and uh, Joe Hollop in the 2,000-point club in Foggy Bottom. Um, you know, similar to Wednesday's game at St. Joe's, uh, Bishop, you know, he tried to put the team on his back and will him the victory. But, um, you know, the Buff and Blue, they were just unable to get enough stops to secure the win. Uh, sure, that sounds familiar. Um, St. Louis, man, they were 12 of 19 from three in the first half. Um, at one point, they made nine in a row. Uh, they went into the break up 55 to 42. Um, yeah, when when a team's shooting like that, it's, it's going to be tough sledding, man. But, um, you know, coming out of the break, GW, they quickly cut the deficit to single digits uh, three minutes into the half. Um, but they, they trailed for most of the game. Uh, they were down, couldn't get inside six points until Bishop made a couple free throws with uh, 7.55 remaining, uh, making it a five-point game. Uh, St. Louis came back, made a layup on the other end, pushed the lead to seven. And that was the last time they made a field goal. Like I said, the last seven minutes, 42 seconds, everything from the free throw line. Um, GW was down 11 with three minutes and 40 seconds remaining. Uh, but they went on a 10-1 run over the next three minutes to cut the lead down to two. Uh, they were down 87-85 with 40 seconds left uh, following a Bishop layup. Um, the Revolutionaries never got the chance to tie the game as it became a free throw contest after that. Uh, St. Louis went 9-10 from the line down the stretch uh, to ice the game. Uh, Bishop, man, he he played all but 38 seconds, you know, finished with 34, 34 points on 11-20 to 20 shooting, including a career-high seven three-pointers, also added six assists, five rebounds, and three steals. Um, Ja'Koy Hutchison, he, uh, he also had a new career-high with 18 points on 7-14, uh, also had seven boards and four assists, and uh, Maximus Edwards had 19 and five. Um, yeah, like I said, man, just super weird game. Um, you know, with uh, that, like with GW being able to um, to actually get some get the ball in the basket in the second half, just being handsy on defense and not being able to get stops um, allowed the Billikens to hit 17 from the free throw line down the stretch of the game, man, that's, that's gotta be a tough one. Um, but, um, but yeah, GW, they'll return to the Smith center for their last home game of the season as they host UMass on Tuesday night at 7 PM. Um, uh, Buff and blue, they'll be looking to get some revenge for a 81 67 loss early in the season. Um, so yeah, man, like you said, Wilson GW, they got some things to work out, man. Look, man, it's been tough for basketball, collegiate, professional ranks in this area for a little bit. Um, you know, for some teams, that is uh, going from GW over to the Maryland women. Uh, they've seen their share of adversity as well. Um, look, I don't even know where to start. Uh, all right, here. I'll find a place to start. Uh, the Terps had two games last week. The first was a home game against visiting Rutgers. Um, and some of what you guys are seeing right now. Maryland built an outstanding lead in this game in the second quarter, dominant defensively in the second quarter. That 16 points you see on the screen, that is what Rutgers ended the first, the first quarter with. See that 553, five minutes left in the first half? They did not score until two minutes, like about 230 left in the first half. 
Um, and if they only surrendered four points, Maryland's defense was amazing. The only negative in that first half for Maryland was senior guard Lavender Briggs. Unfortunately, um, very sad injury. She was hustling for a loose ball, saved the ball, landed a uh, non-contact injury. And, you know, folks have been watching sports long enough the last five, six years. You hear a non-contact injury or you see it, you know, nothing good is coming from it. I feel very bad for the young lady, you know, just a few days after celebrating senior day um, to have it. She tore her ACL to have that type of injury is, is has to be tough. Um, her teammates mentioned after the game this wanting to go out and continue to play for her. And they closed the first half strong um, to the tune of a 23 point lead at the break. But just as remarkable as the second quarter was for Maryland, Rutgers dominated the third quarter thanks to a spark from uh, diminutive, diminutive guard Maya Petticourt. Rutgers was able to get stops, uh, rebound the ball, outscore the Terps 27 17 in the third quarter while shooting 58% from the floor. Which is crazy because that second quarter, nothing, nothing good happened for Rutgers. Credit to them for bouncing back, mentally staying with it, and then getting themselves right. Again, shooting 58% from the floor in the third quarter. Maryland would steady themselves in the fourth um, with a couple of timely shots from Renee Alexander and some top-notch play down the stretch from Cheyenne Sellers. Maryland would go on to beat Rutgers 81-62. to uh, Cheyenne Sellers led the way for the Terps, once again nearly missing out on a triple-double. The junior floor general finished with 21 points, 10 rebounds, 8 assists, 2 steals, and a block. Um, keep in mind, she's still, you know, she came back from a knee injury. She's still not fully 100%, as I'm sure many players aren't about this time in the year. Uh, but hell of a performance from her. They got a good performance from Ali Kubek. Uh, as well with 16 points. Bree McDaniel finished with 13, while Brene Alexander added 12 points by knocking down four triples. Jakia Brown-Turner had 11 points and eight rebounds. Rutgers was led by Destiny Adams, 15 points, eight rebounds and three assists. Cassandra Brown and Lisa Thompson had 11 points apiece. The second game of the week was a road game in... Unfortunately for Maryland, one of the themes here is when they've dealt with uh, teams in the top 25, they just have not started games well. And foul trouble. Foul trouble reared its ugly head. Uh, in this one, you see Cheyenne Sellers there. She only played eight minutes in the first half. We know how important she is to Maryland. Just eight minutes in the first half due to foul trouble. Uh, and Ohio State did what you're supposed to do when a team is missing a key player. They went on a run. Uh, you talked about um, St. Louis shooting the ball well. All right, they The Buckeyes didn't shoot as well as St. Louis did, but they knocked down seven to 14 threes in the first half. Big time shooting. Uh, that put Maryland down 13 at the break. You see here, Maryland's with the nine. They started the second half with the 9-0 run. Uh, Brene Alexander triple would cut the deficit to six late. But Ohio State continued to answer every Terps flurry with a run of their own, which is what you would expect from the second-ranked team in the country playing on their home court. Bree McDaniel led the way with 21 points. Renee Alexander finished with 16 while knocking down five threes. Thought Miller could have, do, could have done a little bit of a better job finding her because she had it going from deep. She's kind of their designated uh, bomber from range. Uh, Maryland's final home game of the regular season is against Wisconsin on Thursday at 6 p.m., uh, it's going to be one of the first times where Maryland's not going to have the double bye heading in to the conference tournament, regardless of what happens on Wednesday. I mean, on Thursday, sorry. Uh, for Maryland, again, as I mentioned, a lot of adversity this season. Um, they're still around. And again, the thing they have in their back pocket, because of that horrendous strength of schedule, their losses aren't as equal to everybody else's losses. Um, when folks start looking at resumes, you're playing some of the I think this year was eight top top 25 teams. You get South Carolina early in the year. I mean, it is what it is. You get UConn early in the year in their building. Look, man, it, I know nobody wants a loss and there's no moral victories, but strength of schedule does indeed matter when you start talking about resume. Um, and again, for this Maryland group, um, definitely proud of them for how they've responded to adversity this year. We'll see how they wrap up the season. So I'll be reporting back to you guys with that next week. 
we're going to take our very first break. When I get back, I'll tell you guys about DC United. The rain are going to get in a rapid fire because Cam Newton's hat, man. We're going to talk about it. Cam Newton's hat defying the law of physics. What material was it, right? <laughs> That's the question. I'm going to give you some time to think about that. We're going to take our first break. You guys are watching the Focus TV. Welcome back, folks. All right, let's get into DC United's season home opener against the visiting New England Revolution. Um, look, man, uh, keep in mind, Troy Lucene, the new coach, was not able to coach in this game due to a suspension from his previous stint with the New York Red Bulls. So the first game, the manager, uh, assistant coach Zach Prince, took the reins, um, and we got a chance to see what things look like under this regime. Um, both teams came out in 4-2-3-1. Uh, Bono right there making a big save in the 17th minute for United on a counterattack by the Revolution. In the 24th minute, we saw Rioni get his second yellow card and he was ejected, which if you're New England, as a visiting team, that is a horrible way to start the year, having to play the majority of the match down a man. Um, oh, yeah, for those of you that do not know, the officials, the referees for the MLS so far this year, um, not the regular officials. They're, they they are in a labor dispute with the league. These are essentially scaps. Um, fun times. Pedro Santos lofted a pass to the cent center of the box in the 33rd minute. We see Christian Beteke, who is arguably, and I don't know how much you want to argue. You guys can see right here, um, the best aerial threat in the MLS. Uh, gets his head on it, puts it in frame. The goalie gets a kick save. but you're not supposed to – you're supposed to save the ball on the right side of the line. His foot was inside the line. It's really that simple, folks. It's, I don't know how else to explain it. So D.C. United goes up 1-0. Really big chance here for D.C. United. Benteke heads it back to the box. And Stroud gets a foot on it a little too much, and the ball hits the crossbar. You see the anguish on his face. Has to hurt because you could have went up 2 nothing in stoppage time. Really good pass from Pedro Santos. A clinical header here. Just a big miss, a crossbar. Every soccer player's uh, most hated, hated defender. <laughs> Just never, never helps. Hardly ever. Um, both keepers with solid saves uh, in the second half as Carlos Hill tried to put it away. Um, the counterattack. Uh, we're watching DC United. They're playing. They said they're going to be more aggressive. They said they're going to be more high pressing. Uh, so it was interesting to see how they fared in transition in the counterattacks because it's going to matter with you pressing the way that this group wants to press. Um, again, to start this second half, got both keepers with good saves. Uh, the Reds will get in the board in the 66th, uh, 66th minute, though off a very classy finish from Carlos Hill. Um, you guys are going to see that in a little bit. It's just a beautiful display of touch on that shot. And he got the shot off before the defense was able to close out. This is a free kick coming up that did not work out for New England. Um, gotta love VAR to reviews. Or I think all fans hit reviews in sports, except when it works in your team's favor. Um, that's a relationship reviews. They're the longest thing in the world to wait for when you hope it's not on your team. And they're the worst thing in the world when it is on your team because you see 70,000 replays of, yeah, they did it. Um, that's the way that it works. But we're going to see that in just a little bit, this beautiful goal from uh, Carlos Hill. Uh, DC would respond. Oh, here it is right here. Um, look, man, this is what you get paid for. This is why he draws so much attention. Quick little cut, and look at the touch on that. Upper 90, real easy, nothing you can do about that. You feel bad for the keeper there because you're just stuck. Like, is it? Is it or isn't it? Uh, it is. It is a fact the goal is 1-1. One, one. Uh, DC would respond in the 71st minute as Connor Atley wins the ball and plays it to the far post. As a sliding Christian Benteke knocks it past the keeper for his second score of the night, that gives D.C. United the 2-1 lead. Uh, for the most part, D.C.'s defense was pretty stout um, for the night. Again, I was impressed by it with the way they were going to be pushing up just a bit more. Um, with 
We had Click missed wide on the free kick and stoppage time in the second half. Um, the black and red weren't done as – I'm going to move this ahead a little bit. We're going to see Christian Bateke do what it is that he does. This is his second goal for you guys. This is it. It's just a live threat. You just put it up near him. He's going to go get it. That's all DC United is doing. We're putting it up on the top shelf, and no one can do anything about it because he's Christian Bateke. It's really that simple. All right, here we go. In stoppage time, seven minutes to wait. Over top of the keeper. Keep in mind, the keeper six 6'5". He's levitating, he's levitating out here. It's just that simple. There's no bad pass. You put it up on the top shelf, he's going to go get it. And, uh, again, three goals, which means it's a hat trick. For those of you in the matter of sport, it's a hat trick. Anytime someone scores three goals. And that's a hell of a way to start the season. Three goals, get a hat trick. Um, Aaron Herrera with the assist on this one. DC United opens the season with the 3-1 victory under the new regime. So you got to love that. Uh, if you're a fan of DC United, we'll see how this goes as things move forward. Um, they will be playing. I, they have Inter Miami this week on Saturday, but also of note, Christian Benteke was voted Major League Soccer Player the uh, Soccer Player of Match Day for the opening week of the 2024 MLS season. Again, I don't know how you can argue three goals in the first game. I feel like that puts you like again, man. Who can say anything back to you? All three goals, all you. And again, uh, great start for DC United. Look forward to see how they build on that. And the second game of the season, we'll get to see Troy Lacine actually on the sideline, uh, doing what it is that they want him to do here. Just shout out to Zach Prince for uh, handling the reins, and you know DC United for taking care of business at home. We're gonna take our second break, and when we get back, <laughs> rapid fire. Welcome back to the Focus TV. I'm going to go ahead and just put this up here now, man. It's going to make this real easy. You know what we're going to be talking about, right? You knew early. All right, so it's officially time for rapid fire. You guys see <laughs> what the first topic is. I don't know how much time we're going to spend on this. But we're going to talk about it because everybody has varying. It's, today is a wonderful time to live. That's That's all I got to say. Um, I'm old, old man yells at cloud, all that good stuff for real here. Top shelf performance, got into it with Cameron Newton on at a 7-7 event in Atlanta over the weekend. While Cam hasn't come forth and shared his side, which I'm sure we will hear on his podcast, uh, where, you know, we've, we this is, this is probably going to be bigger than the game manager, game changer thing, um, which turned into a fun meme during all of this. This weekend, uh, we had two members of the top shelf performance coaches, if you will, adults uh, in charge of leading the youth to caretaking over the youth uh, to be role models for the youth. Um, involved in this altercation, so they popped up on either a podcast or radio show, what have you. Someone handed them a platform and a couple microphones because it's 2024 and podcast podcast equipment does not have limits or for whatever reason. Um, so paraphrasing it, this all stemmed from long running trash talk from Cam Newton, apparently five years worth. We saw like some explanation that was shared on Twitter. Apparently, between the last five years, they were all under one, one group. These guys branched out, started their own group. Cam's talking trash. And for five years, I guess they took it, but this day it was just too much, apparently. I don't know what it was that was said this day. Um, but they were saying the trash talking is what sparked this off. Uh, one of the men alleged that, you know, Cam started with his little brother and he just wanted to go, you know, uh, jump in for his little brother, even though, you know, video looks a little different. Again, we'll see what Cam has to say. It's usually one person, another person, and the truth is somewhere in the middle. But there's video. Um, and even with the video, I got a question for you, right? Um, why are normal folks running down on pro athletes and throwing hands? especially NFL players who have decided to play a sport in which they give up their bodies and sometimes brains, um, like the health of their brains, to get involved in multiple car crashes throughout games for the duration of their career. This guy, as folks would say, absolute 
unit, specimen. Whatever may have been said, Ray, does that justify running down on Cam Newton? Um, and also, just from you know the the responsibility part of you know uh, you're supposed to be role models and coaches, what have you. What is this? We we've been seeing Cam get disrespected at all these events, and he's always around. So people talk about where his security is. Right, he is his own security. He's 6'6, 260. Like, <laughs> he, how many times did we see him like take on defensive linemen without his own line, or times when his own line walked up and he's eye to eye with his own line or taller than them, which is doesn't need security. Um, but your thoughts on this altercation, uh, for me, either side, and then some of the many interesting think pieces that have stemmed from it. Um, yeah, first of all, foolishness. How, how do you end up fighting? That's that's what I want to know. But even even more than that, why did you think you were going to be successful? They're, they're actually very lucky that Cam showed some bit of restraint because he, that that could have got bad. You know, I mean, it was obvious he wasn't he was trying to just trying to protect himself and restrain him. Like if he, I'm sure if he felt like at any point there was real danger, yeah, we we'd be having a different conversation. Most likely involving somebody in the hospital or worse. So um, so yeah, you might want to choose a different strategy to to <laughs> to resolve your grievances. But um, but yeah, that just wasn't the best decision making. Um, yeah, it, it is also um. Cause yeah, like you said, man, we see a lot of videos of Cam Newton being these things and just getting disrespected for some reason, man. I don't, I don't get it. Um, you know, you've got a former NFL MVP guy took his team to a Super Bowl. You know, he's coming out to <laughs> try to, you know, lend his knowledge and and even even just him being there brings publicity. You know, brings legitimacy to whatever event that's going on. And he's met with, you know, with disrespect. Um, I, I don't understand what that's about. Uh, you know, so um, so yeah, hopefully, you know, that doesn't dissuade him to try to continue to um, you know, to reach back and, and do things for these young people. But, you know, maybe he just make make different decisions about where and who he does these things with. Um but yeah, so like some some of the think pieces, like let, 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 let's let's chill with that, man. You know, the first thing people like to run to do, you don't see this happening to the Mannings, blah blah blah. First of all, we gotta stop. <laughs> we gotta stop <laughs> exalting white people as the the barometer for for good behavior. Stop that, please. Um, second of all, th this is not a a widespread thing. This is happening to one individual person repeatedly, which it shouldn't happen, you know, by, by no means, you know, he's out there giving up his time, you know, to try to make things, make a memorable event for some young kids. He shouldn't be met with this. And then in some cases, it's, the disrespect is coming from the kids, which, which lends me to ask where are the adults at to check these kids, you know, to tell them, Hey man, look, Recognize who you're standing in front of, you know. Um, uh, Cardell, you know, he shared a story a while ago about um, there was an event at uh, at Bowie City uh, Gym, and um, and JoJo Hunter was speaking to some kids, and uh, you know, they just were kind of blowing them off. I'm sure they didn't know who he was, but um, I believe he said it was uh, Ed Ed Myers that was like, "Hey guys." <laughs> Listen to what he has to say. He's he's been seeing some things, you know, and he was pretty good at, at the sport. So, you know, you need to listen up. Like, so it, it's just just a lack of guidance all around. Um, yeah, and like you pointed out, man, he, these are the adults <laughs> setting this poor example for the youth that they're supposed to be leading. Um, we got to get the losers out of youth sports. Um, we got to get the guys who got cut from JV in 11th grade out of youth sports. Um, we got to get people back at the helm that are just there to help kids, which they should be doing. Uh, these people trying to live, trying to relive the glory days of the past or, or what have you, 
get, get them out of there. You know, if people are running organizations and they see a hint of that, get let those people go because um, they're going to end up in a situation like this. You know, like who, nobody would ever think that we'd be seeing Cam Newton fighting at a seven on seven youth youth event. But yet here we are. So we 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 got to clean all this shit up, man. Just just frankly speaking, it's um, you know, it's disgusting. It's a disservice to the kids. It's a disservice to to uh, to the respective sports. So um, yeah, we got to get a handle on this somehow. Um, I don't know how we do that or how we even begin that process, but um, I, I think it just starts with people having some integrity. So um, so yeah, man, that's that's my thoughts. But anybody in the future. If you ever feel the need to try to <laughs> lay hands on a professional athlete, especially like Wilson said, somebody that ragdolls defensive linemen, please rethink that because they might not be as tolerant as Cam was. That's the part. I agree with everything you said, by the way, but that's the part I feel like people are leaving out. What if that was one of the many NFL players who aren't fully all the way in control of their faculties in a situation like that? I just want to be honest. Like, and it's not, I'm throwing, I'm going to throw some names out and this is not their character or anything like that. If that's the Pouncy twins, how does this end? Just, that's a couple of D tackles. How does this end? That's a linebacker. How does it end? Just being completely honest. And, and like you said, I give all the credit to Cam in the world. I don't care what was said. Um, your adults figure it out. Also, if someone was talking trash to you for five years, why what changed today on this particular day? If you've been taking it every I'm I'm one of those people where you've been taking it every day and it's not that deep, let it go. Also, if y'all were together and then you started something separate or whatever, you branched off. What's what's isn't that normal? Like, I'm confused. Like, y'all gonna talk and compete, right? Because y'all not together, whatever it is. And I, I saw one of the things, again, paraphrases, one of the guys were like, well, he was like saying that, you know, he made us. Okay, so be quiet. So what? Say something back and keep him. And? <laughs> like, and? And then, like, you were talking about the, the thing that, that kills it for me when they got on whatever platform it was and trying to play victim or whatever. It was like the little video that came out the day before, the day of, when he was talking about the quarterback. He wasn't talking about Cam. He was talking about one of the kids on in the Cam Newton program. Who are you as the coach talking like that? Like, if you want to have a conversation off wax to the side about your coaches, it pertains to, like, scouting that seven on seven team or whatever, cool. But you're on camera talking about the kid like you're – like, that's your peer. Like, I expect that out of another kid. Grown. What, what are we doing? And I, I just can't take any of it seriously. And, again, they need to be so grateful that Cam Newton is in control of all his faculties, man, because – or that he wasn't having a bad, just that he's in that, that much control. Cause he did not try to hurt anybody at all. That was like, you know, the, what's it called? The security dude that was on uh, Twitter and social media for a while, fighting <laughs> folks in the circle, passing around. That's what this was. Like, they need to thank God. That's what, on, <laughs> that's the type of time Cam Newton was on today. That's literally that skit on that video. Okay, we just calmly just go that way, shoot fly, get out of here. No closed fists, no open, you know, turn the wrist away to discard people. <laughs> no open hand slaps. You know what would happen if you connect to <laughs> Come on, man. Gra grab one of the little dudes by the hair. Like, what, what are we doing here, man? But um, we're going to move on. Ah, NBA officials, my favorite. Yet another instance of NBA referees having some terrible moments. We saw this is just a still clip, right? Just a little screen grab of Asar Thompson essentially getting tackled by Dante DiVincenzo while chasing down a loose ball with 8.5 seconds left in a very tight game. Um, if you're wondering how Dante got there, it's because he ran through Asar. Asar was actually there first. That's how this picture gets to looking like that. So, you know, one plus one. For you to get here when someone was in front of you, what do y'all think had to happen? Um, <laughs> no foul was called. Then after the game, which is my favorite part, because my whole thing is like, I like the days where you didn't call a foul or you swallowed the whistle. And we didn't have to hear you tell us about it. I don't have to hear you tell me that you were wrong or the, the last two minute report, whatever it might be. We have the official saying, quote, upon post game review, we determined that Thompson gets to the ball first and then was deprived of the opportunity to gain possession of the ball. He was taken out for those of you that's trying to parse this. 
Uh, therefore, a loose ball foul should have been whistled on New York's Dante DiVincenzo. The second part of this is Monty Williams being fed up, saying that they've been through things like this several times. Uh, no calling enough is enough. We've done it the right way. We've called the league. We've sent in clips. We're sick of hearing the same stuff over and over again. Keep in mind, the Pistons record is what it is. That said, you know, two things can be true at the same time. Your thoughts on the foul not being called, yet another wonderful moment for NBA officials. And then Monty Williams comments, because some people are like, well, your record's trash. You can't feel like that. Um, yeah, I think we had something similar a few weeks ago. And yeah, my, my stance hasn't changed. This is absolutely ridiculous. Um, like you said, we know you missed, missed the call. You're not informing us or giving some great revelation the next day saying, by, oh, by the way, we, we messed that one up. Like, j- just don't say anything. We know. <laughs> we know. We don't need you to help us. And they got to figure out some type of way to hold these guys accountable. I'm sorry. That gentleman right there in the picture, staring intently at the whole thing unfold, he needs to get fined or something. Do something because that's ridiculous. How do you not call that? That's some of the greatest open field tackling I've ever seen. How do you not call that foul? <laughs> like, that's crazy. And at that juncture in the game, like, come on, man. They they gotta they gotta figure this out. Um, first, stop this LTM thing. L- stop it. Stop it. Stop doing that. We don't need it. Like. Whatever side you were on before the the two minute report came out, you're going to be on that side after it came out. So we don't need that. It it's not changing anything. We're not replaying the last two minutes. Do away with that. I don't know why it was introduced in the first place. Um, I guess it was for accountability measure, but it's not holding anyone accountable. It's just stating the obvious. Um, as far as Monty Williams goes, uh, I mean. On the one hand, yeah, your your team sucks. That is what it is. Um, on the other hand, he can he can speak on that because that's ridiculous. He can speak on that. Um, I think he was getting a little too dangerously close to framing it about how the reason why their record is the way it is is because of some referee stuff. Nah, dog. Just talk about that one play and keep it moving. Don't uh. <laughs> don't bring up nothing in the past because you ain't got a leg to stand on with that. But um, but as far as this instant goes, he has every right to be pissed. So um, so yeah, man, it, it is what it is. But yeah, they they gotta figure this rough thing out. Man, it's horrible. Like my whole thing is, if you missed it, talk about it later quietly. Don't, man, just lie to me. I'm I'm cool. Honestly, I'm not mad at you. Like from the bottom of my heart, we stand on it. And I'm cool. I'm not. No one's gonna say a word and be like, you know what? That's how that group officiates. Cool. Pull the NFL refs. Just don't care. Like, do whatever you do and be like, yep. <laughs> what y'all gonna do? No, we don't call hold it. It's the playoffs. Refs, they got my net. <laughs> we <laughs> don't call holding. Beat the block. We see it every year in the playoffs. Everyone's favorite pass rush is like, Raph, where's the flag? <laughs> Look like you didn't get by him. You said you got hands, right? Use them. Like, oh. an offensive lineman, though, every year we get the playoffs. She <laughs> Headlock, whatever you got to do. Just stop telling me that you messed up. Or do the soccer thing. Just bring VAR over. We're going to go this hard. Just bring VAR over. Just stop it 20 seconds later. Make them go to the monitor immediately like they did for the Benteke goal and be like, you know what? That's a foul. My bad. Uh, Pistons ball. Because right now, whatever you got going, and I know soccer fans hate VAR, but this is worse. Like, pick one. Go full NFL and just, yup. Everybody, just unity. Just, yup. Or don't, but this is horrible, man. Got a fun one here. It's combine week. You know, people love talking about things that just don't matter at all. Marvin Harrison Jr. Um, 
I don't mention senior, just junior. I only mention senior by saying senior. Y'all know who I'm talking about. It's not going to be working out the combine this week. Y'all got a problem? Talk to senior. Uh, stating that he'll meet with teams but will remain in Columbus, Ohio, uh, working to prepare for his rookie season in the NFL. Of course, some folks are ripping him for this. Thoughts of him declining the opportunity to go participate in the combine, uh, although he's going to meet with teams. Because some folks, you know, not getting into who, are ripping him for this decision. Your thoughts, Ray? What does he need to go to the combine for? You you know what he is. <laughs> what, what what is he gonna What is he gonna prove to you that it that hasn't already been proven? Like, come on, man, get a life, please get a life. Like it, it's he it's not like he's gonna <laughs> he's gonna show you something that you didn't think he could do. Um, we know what he is. <laughs> like he's a stud. Th- this is what people in his position do. Like if anybody's ever listened to Knuckleheads. You know, Q and uh, D Mouse have a you know a continuous little fun back and forth where they talk about their draft process. Q's like, I worked out for sixteen teams. I was flying here, here, and here. D Mouse and he always says D Mouse was just having steak dinners and taking meetings because he was a top three pick. That's how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> Get over it. And I guarantee no team is not going to draft him as high as they were going to because he's not the combine. Get over it, man. He is what he is. He don't need to come by. Uh, also, folks, I just I just hate to be this person. It's mostly entertainment. It is a business convention, okay? The stuff that they put on TV for us is to keep y'all quiet and entertained and clapping about nothing. So, you know how everyone's making those big deals about, like, why are men wearing sport bras or, like, the little things that have the GPS trackers in it? So, like, we tried to tell some of y'all folks seven, eight, nine years ago. They are GPS trackers. So you're not a combine. You're kind of trying to, you're having somebody do something they don't do in the actual game of football. And then you guys are training for these specific events, like some mini miniature Olympics. And then you're hoping and trying to say that it's transferable, even though there's, the, there's this wonderful thing called tape. It's games that they play. So they wear these little GPS trackers. You know what they can do because the GPS trackers kind of track how fast you go. You can just find out how fast somebody is with the ball in their freaking hands in a situation with people chasing them. It's really crazy. Like, technology is wild. Or you could take somebody's 40 time. I don't know about you, Ray, but um, just give me the GPS tracker. I could just I could just call the school or, you know, contact the school, or what have you, bring up the game that I'm talking about, be like, hey, what did he reach during this play? What was his top speed? Oh, 21 miles an hour. Oh, 22 miles an hour. And if you're Marvin Harrison, Jr., if you're Jr., I'm not going to go race some of these dudes with track backgrounds and the thing that I don't do. That is just backwards because you know what's going to happen is folks going to get up here talking out the side of their mouth like, well, that's a chink in the armor. And I ain't running nothing. I'm not going anywhere. Full D-Miles. I love that you brought that up. Full D-Miles. Yes. What you want to know? Some of y'all could call Sr. if you want to know. It's really simple. You call senior, you pull up the tape. Like, what are we talking about? Sometimes people are exactly who they are. What are y'all ripping this? Just because y'all want to see him run? Because that's what it comes down to. I want to see him in the combine, catch a pass from a dude he don't know. He just did that at Iowa State for two years. <laughs> what else y'all need to see? Like, let it go, man. And again, GPS tracker, folks. Let it go. And some of you teams that care more about 40 times the GPS tracker or why the team that you root for is so bad. He's going to let you know off the top. It's fumbling the scouting thing because they're worried about something that's kind of outdated. But it is what it is. Last but not least, man, combine week, which means it is full-blown lying season. We got Ron Post up here, GM of the Chicago Bears. We're not going to get into any of the prospects. We just want to talk about this um, because something has to be done soon. Uh, NFL free agency, the tampering period starts March 11th. It officially begins March 13th. We are looking at March late, like in a few days, we're in March. A couple weeks away from NFL free agency, which comes before the draft in the NFL. Um, people have been going back and forth about, do you keep Justin Fields? Do you move Justin Fields? What do you end up doing? Uh, that's resurfaced as he spoke at the um, uh, combine today. They have the opportunity. They have, this is what the Bears looking at. You can select, uh, you can retain Justin Fields. Uh, trade down or select someone else you deem worthy of the number one pick. 
Uh, Trey Fields, select the new signal caller with the number one pick. General, Minor, uh, General Manager Ryan Post spoke to the media today and had this to say. It depends on what opportunities pop up. I will say this. I think you guys know me well enough now. If we go down that road, I want to do right by Justin as well. No one wants to live in gray. I know that's uncomfortable. I wouldn't want to be in that situation either. So we will gather the information. We will move as quickly as possible, but we are not going to be in a rush and see what presents itself and what's best for the organization. What's all that mean to you, Ray? Yeah, yikes. Um, sounds like they're about to mess this up, to be perfectly honest. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's, it is a precarious situation. Um, it's very delicate. Uh, you make the wrong move. And yeah, man, you you 10 steps uh, back further than where you started. Um, you know, I, th I think we, we talked about this at one point. You brought up a good, a good point. Um, how do those guys in the locker room feel about Justin Fields, because um, I mean, and he's shown some strides and moving in the right direction. So you know, if like if they mess with that guy, and he's showing improvement, and you move him, that guy has some ripple effects, man. So um, so yeah, they how they handle this situation is going to dictate <laughs> the next. <laughs> six years for them um, because it's around the centerpiece of the organization. Quarterback is the most important position um, for in almost every situation. So, um, so yeah, man, more power to them. Uh, you know, hope they handle this correctly. Um, I don't envy the guys that got to make those decisions. Oh, no, not at all. It's a, and I, and I would hope like it, like you said, it's a very precarious situation. I would also warn against doing the feeling thing. I'm sure Justin's a great guy and everything that happened. However, you did not draft Justin. A lot of this to happen. You're here to clean up something that was done before you in polls. Got here last year. You took over. If you can ship Roquan Smith out without blinking an eye, well, you got the number one pick. <laughs> do what you need to do. Set the clock back and go forward. I'm interested in what they end up doing. They have the first pick and the ninth pick. So you you can you're in a great you're in a great place. However, if like you said, if it turns out that you do all this stuff and Justin's not the guy, then that, you're back in a couple of years trying to find who the guy is. But you you know your team is not gonna be the same as it is right now. You know you traded for Montez Sweat last season. Um, so does that mean you? Does this mean Justin gets another go with this this group underneath? You know, new uh, the coach stayed the same, but some of the staff has changed or. Does a new quarterback get – they get to start in a better situation than Justin got to start? That's the situation. And I've been part of this through the fan side too where it's like, nah, my guy, he came in, give him the chance, give him the chance, he needs the chance. At the same time, right, you get a new five years if you're the GM if you select the quarterback. That You know what I'm saying? That, that extends the clock on your job. Also – all the cap room you got, you got another top 10 pick. You got an opportunity to have the number one, number one overall pick in the draft, have a bunch of cash, cap space, uh, a bunch of cash to spend, and give this – possibly give your rookie quarterback a hell of a start, like a hell of a landing where you can fix all the stuff that – you can you can give him exactly what Justin never got, which has nothing to do with Justin because you weren't here for that. but. We'll see what ends up happening because you need – teams are going to have to know soon. Free agency is going to start. Free agency is usually when it dictates uh, some folks' hands in terms of what they're going to go towards in the draft because of what you're able to get in free agency. Free agency is going to be crazy this year. The cap went up $30 million. Bad teams do dumb stuff all the time. We've seen good players get cut just because the cap went up and people are like, well, we can afford the dead cap space. That's stupid. I think Shaquille Barrett got cut like yesterday from the Bucks for – because they're going to save $6 million. Right, you the Buccaneers. What's that $6 million? That has nothing to do with keeping Mike Evans or not. That's what you need to focus on. Focus on if Baker Mayfield's going to be a quarterback or not. But Shaquille Barrett's not. Uh, you saw the Falcons let go of John Smith, which is cool if you're a Kyle Pitts fan. Because you're like, hey, Kyle Pitts might get the ball in the ring more, which is great. But now John o. Smith just out there, and the good team's probably be like, hey, John o. Smith, you want to come be tight end two for nothing? Because – Cafes, 
Like, come on, guys. But I want to thank y'all for tuning in this week. Don't forget, if you're uh, your Wizard Outlook folks, uh, one of the folks at Wizards Outlook, uh, we'll see y'all, you know, like in a couple of, in an hour or so as we're taping this. I appreciate y'all tuning in this week. We'll check back in with you guys next week, which I'm sure we'll have a lot of things to check up on. And uh, we'll have some post-combine thoughts by next week. So Octavia will be back to go over some of that stuff with y'all. And we'll be a little bit closer to free agency. Some of these rumors will be a little bit more. We should get some better rumors by next week after people finish lying throughout this week. Uh, so we'll see what happens, you guys. Another episode of Focus TV. Y'all have a great week.